Father, I do. I thank you for this evening, Lord. I thank you for your word, Father. I pray that you would just uh, prepare our hearts right now, Father, to hear from you. I pray, Father, that you would reveal to us something for each one of us personally to take home tonight, Lord. That you'd speak through me, Father, uh, to your people, Father, and that you'd encourage us in your word, Lord. I pray, Father, you'd do uh, do that work in those areas, Father, uh, that we need uh, you to do that work in, Father. So, Father, we give you this evening. We pray, Father, that uh, you would be glorified and magnified. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're starting a new book tonight. Last week we had finished up uh, the Gospel of Mark. And we had a, a brief account at the very end of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the command to go and to share the Gospel. The Gospel had spread quickly when the prosecute or the persecution uh, started this letter tonight is written by John one of the brothers of James who also wrote the gospel of John he is writing the gospel to people who have hold on a second let's see if we can get some glasses oh, that'll help tonight we're going to be reading with glasses Okay, <laughs> he is writing to the people who could have been the children to the ones that were a part of the early church, spreading the good news. So they could have been second generation. Even though John is not named in this letter, the writing style and the things that were written were written and are very similar to the gospel of John, almost word for word at times. There is also uh, external evidence that John is the author Polycarp, a close associate of John, appeared to, the, uh, appeared to make reference to the epistle in the letter of the, uh, to a letter to the Philippians in the beginning of the second century. Irenaeus, a student of Polycarp, wrote from the epistle and attributed it to John. Even early manuscripts did not agree, or they did not agree with uh, the author not being John. So we have Polycarp who speaks of John. We have uh, his disciple, Polycarp, uh, I think his name's Irenaeus. He spoke that this gospel was from John. So we have pretty good evidence that this message, this letter that we're going to be looking at tonight, is from John, the same one who wrote the gospel. It's written around uh, 80, 85 A.D., after the time of Christ, to about 95. And most scholars have uh, agreed that it's probably closer to 95. So it's going to be about 50 to 60 years after the resurrection of Jesus, which means John could have been in his early 90s if he was about the same age as Jesus, Jesus was when he was born. This is not a letter written uh, to certain churches, it's possible that this letter was written and intended to be circulated, uh, not to one specific place. Some even think that it could have been a sermon of John's. It's not written in a style of a letter, which is why some people think that it could have been a sermon. And in this epistle, John writes to people who are familiar with the message about Jesus Christ. Paul wrote to uh, the Colossians in First. Or Colossians chapter 1, verse 23, that every creature under heaven had heard about the gospel. Not that everyone in the world had heard the good news, but they were all familiar with the news about Jesus Christ. So either because these people have had read the gospel, or John had explained it to them, or they read the gospel of John, uh, they were familiar with this news about Jesus Christ. And in this letter, John is not correcting a certain body of believers, but building on the things that they have already heard and seen and had been taught or reminded of. And he's not addressing issues like we had talked about, but this letter is thought to be written from Ephesus, where John was the leader of the church there, and over the churches in all of Asia Minor, over which John exercised apostolic leadership. If the date is correct, the fall of Jerusalem had already happened in 70 AD, and the world is a very different place. The temple is destroyed, and John would be the last living apostle of the original 12, and the last eyewitness 
who had a close relationship with Jesus and was there throughout his earthly ministry. Death, his resurrection, and his uh, ascension to heaven. See, John is the only one of the disciples that died of natural causes. And this letter would be a big deal when the gospel was shared to the people who received it. And it uh, also uh, addresses some false teachers. Uh, Acts, it seems, uh, talks about teaching about Jesus Christ and then someone stepping up and coming in and trying to lead the people away. So we have false teachers springing up very quickly in the beginning of the spreading of the gospel. One of the false teachings that sprang up in the church uh, is addressed in this letter. It's called Gnosticism. We also see Paul dealing with this in some of his letters. Gnosticism was the belief that through knowledge, man could rise above the physical to the spiritual. These Gnostics believed everything spiritual is good and everything physical was evil. Jesus Christ could not be God because God would never take on sinful flesh. If you wanted to know the real Jesus, you had to go to them because they could teach you the truth. This is why in this letter, John writes so forcefully that Jesus is God and had come in the flesh. He had seen him in flesh and bones. John saw him. He heard his voice. And in this letter, John gives us four reasons why he wrote the letter. He writes, so all those who believe can be sure that they will be saved. This confidence is found in Jesus and produces joy in your life. It's that knowledge that your sins are forgiven and you can have a relationship with God. John knows that even though our sins are forgiven in Christ, that we will still sin. One of the verses people remember in 1 John is, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. So John writes these things so that we don't sin. But if we do, we have an advocate in Jesus Christ, he says. With the false teaching in the church, John also writes, so we would have confidence in Jesus and therefore not be deceived by anyone bringing any new news, teaching anything different. And finally, John writes, so that we would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we have eternal life. How miserable it would be to know, to never know if you're loved by God and if he accepts you, if you're going to spend eternity with him, or if you just quite haven't made it yet. So John writes that you would know you have eternal life. So here's the four reasons he writes, so that your joy may be full and that you may have fellowship with God, that you might not sin to keep you from being deceived, and that you may know that you have eternal life. So that's just some of the the beginning of the book of 1 John here. We're going to pick it up in chapter 1, verse 1. It says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness, and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. So picking it up in verse 1, it says, that which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen our, with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. And unlike other letters directed to someone or to a certain group, John would may have been in his 90s at this time uh, and starts off this letter telling us about Jesus Christ. That's his main goal, to talk about Jesus, that which is from the beginning. Now, John could be talking about the beginning of the gospel or the beginning of Jesus' life here on earth, but because he also brings up eternity, John is going way back. Before Jesus ever walked on the face of the earth, he existed 
At the beginning of creation, Jesus was there, he says. In John chapter 1, verse 3, it says, All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. The point John is making is not that Jesus was some great man that he wanted, wants to tell us about, but that Jesus existed from the very beginning with God. John 1.3 had told us Jesus was the one created that created everything. Right at the start, Jesus is more than we can possibly understand. And this word from beginning not only points to time, it also points to order. Before anything else existed, he existed. He is the first in creation, in importance. He is the foundation on which all else is built. And not only is John saying he is first, but that he is the beginning. He is God. He is the source of it all. And in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. John goes on and says, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our, eye, our hands have handled. See, in his flesh, the disciples were able to actually hear God speak, see him with their own eyes and touch him. This is a personal experience that John had daily. The last of the original 12 living and telling of the creator of the universe and how he sat and talked with them. Paul said in Colossians chapter 1, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Therefore, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. See, John makes comments as he describes Jesus and says, concerning the word of life. Just like in the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the word, this letter, that theme of or description of Jesus is still a main point of his. See, this is one of many connections that we see with the Gospel of John. And just like in the Gospel, the word became flesh. John 1.14 tells us, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. See, the life, in verse 2 it picks up, says, And the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness, and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. So in the end of Mark, the disciples were told multiple times that Jesus was alive. And we are told that they didn't believe it. John didn't believe it until he saw it for himself. And these disciples were not going to be tricked. They not only walked with Jesus while he was alive and ministering to the people, they also were with him after he was raised from the dead. And just like the two followers on the road to Emmaus had their eyes opened and the word of God was revealed to them, John had his eyes opened. He saw Jesus. And after Jesus went to be with the Father, these followers of Jesus looked at the word of God very differently. And not only did they go to their graves telling the people that Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophecies written, he is the Messiah, and we can only come to God through faith in Jesus Christ. They also declared that this Jesus is not just some savior man, he is God in the flesh. It was manifested or made clear to them just who Jesus truly is. We have seen God not quite like Moses, but in a very special way. And as John writes, he gives us reading his letter this amazing account of his life. I walked with him, he says. I laid my head in his lap. Just like Mary knew who Jesus was when he spoke her name, John knew who Jesus was. And one of these days, we'll get to, I hope, lay our heads in his lap, sit that close to him, be that intimate with him. To know him in that intimate way. See, this is John's testimony of when God walked this earth he created. John was there. This is the one we declare to you, he says, the eternal 
that which was with the Father and was revealed to us, who is creator of everything, and let us handle him, the one who knew us before we existed, the one who will live forever. He is the one John writes about in First John here. Verse 3 picks it up and he says, That which we have seen and heard we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. See, all that John has seen and heard he declares or wants to tell us. See, there's nothing he's trying to hide. You can see more of what John had declared about Jesus in the Gospel of John. And in this letter, he has just gotten started. We're only three verses in. And if we didn't have some understanding of who Jesus is and who John is, this letter would be difficult to start. Difficult to start reading because you would have all kinds of questions. That's why we could say this letter is written to believers and to those who have heard about Jesus. It isn't until this verse that you see Jesus Christ even mentioned. And if you have read the gospel account recently, you will understand what is written here a little bit quicker. So if you have time to, I'd encourage you to read the gospel of John, at least the first chapter, so that you can make these connections a little bit quicker. And John goes on to tell us that the reason he is telling us about this Jesus Christ is so we can have fellowship with him. Even though you, have not under, you may not understand how all this works, you can still have fellowship with Jesus and other believers. You may think it wouldn't be too difficult to have fellowship with Jesus. I might be able to do that. But fellowship with God, that doesn't seem so easy. John is saying that we can have this fellowship with God and his son, like John and the rest of the believers do. See, fellowship is an association or a, a partnership. To have fellowship with God is to be in agreement with him. To have fellowship with others, there must be a connection, something that links two people together, something you have in common. And if you want that fellowship with God, it can only happen when we come to believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. See, we believe with God that we have sinned and fallen short of his standards, that we can't do it on our own, and we need someone to save us. That is when we are pointed to Jesus, the one who came and died for my sins and is now alive. See, he restores that fellowship with God. See, there was this time when man had close, intimate fellowship with him. He walked together with God in the garden. And because sin, Adam and Eve had broken this fellowship, John is saying we can have this fellowship once again, but sin has broken it, and we were alienated from God. We have turned our backs on God. All we like sheep, it says, have gone astray. The Bible says there is none that seek after God. We are even told before we come to believe in Jesus Christ, we are at war with him. Ephesians 2, 3 tells us we once were driven by our sin and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. Ephesians 2 says, But God who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So our connection, the reason we can have fellowship with God is because of Jesus Christ. We are found in him. The idea of fellowship is one of the most important ideas in this letter of John's. It is the ancient Greek word koinonia, which speaks of a sharing, a communion, a common bond, and uh, a common life. It speaks of a living, breathing, caring, loving relationship with another person. Jesus said, after he was resurrected, to tell his disciples. In John verse 20, it says, But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. 
See, the relationship Jesus had with God, the Father, was the same relationship that we can have. My kids, they have a, a access to me. And as God's kids, we have access to him. See, he is our father. We have something in common because through Christ, we belong to him now. I was reading in Jeremiah, and this, word, this verse jumped off the page to me. It said in uh, Jeremiah, the Lord gave another message to Jeremiah. He said, have you noticed what people are saying? The Lord chose Judah and Israel and then abandoned them. They are sneering and saying that Israel is not worthy to be counted as a nation. But this is what the Lord says. I would no more reject my people than I would change my laws that govern night and day, earth and sky. I will never abandon the descendants of Jacob or David, my servant, or change the plan that David's descendants will rule the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Instead, I will restore them to their land and have mercy on them. That is how God feels about his people. And through faith, we have been adopted, grafted in. We have become children of God and his chosen people. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm, because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us, who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. See, God will never change the way he feels about us, and he will never change the way we come to him. See, Jesus is the only way, and there will never be another way. You belong to him, and he will never change his mind about the way he feels about you. John picks it up in verse 4, and he says, And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. This is, the one, this is one of the things John says for the reason of this letter. We write to you that your joy may be full. True joy is a result of a relationship with the Lord. It comes when we are in fellowship with God. John writes that your joy may be full, which brings up the question, is there a half joy? Can I have some joy and still not be filled with joy? The answer is yes. Joy is great pleasure and happiness and is often linked with rejoicing. Happiness and joy can be defined very similarly, but the difference is that happiness is often based on your circumstances where joy, like we have in his word, is based on God. And even though joy and happiness are very similar in their meaning, the focus is not on the feeling of happiness or joy, but on the reason for that joy. Often we have a hard time being joyful, because although your hope is not in this world, your affliction and your trials are. And when you are scraping by from one moment to another, it is hard to rejoice Perhaps you're sick as a dog and you feel miserable. I could see you struggling to rejoice in that. Maybe you lost a job or have to move. Your friends have turned their backs on you or someone has been deliberately cruel. The passing of a loved one, all of these things can rob you of your happiness and make it difficult to have joy. Joy is definitely available to you, but not all of us have joy to the fullest. There was a man, I'll see one of these days, who when asked how he was doing, would often respond, any better, I couldn't stand it. He was dying of cancer, and yet he could still say the same thing. His hope, his focus, was not on the circumstances, but on what God was doing for him. We need reminders, someone to help us with our focus from time to time, so that even when the waves are crashing over the side of your little boat, you can still see where your hope is. So is your hope on what God has done and is doing for you? 
Sure, it may not be peaches and cream at home. The struggles are real. It is almost Christmas time, which is a very difficult time for a lot of people. There is someone who may not be here this year, or maybe family is difficult. Perhaps you have cancer or health issues, and when asked how you are doing or what are your plans for the holiday, your face sinks and your demeanor changes. Thanks for being honest, but let God's word encourage you. Our joy, our hope, our future is not based on this life. Our joy is in Jesus Christ. It is the time of year we celebrate him. Joy is an ornament you would find on a tree, but is joy the attitude of your heart? Is your thoughts, your hope, and the wonderful gift you've been given? The amazing sacrifice that was paid for you? Or are you at this moment just aware of that gift? You're thankful for it, but your joy is running low. James wrote in James chapter 1, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And in John chapter 15, he says, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. See, you can have joy even when you're going through the most difficult week ever, or the hardest time of the year, or even your life. If our joy is to remain full, it is going to have to come from somewhere else because on our own, we have very little strength to stand the trials coming our way. When you think about this great battle we face, doesn't God give us the tools we need to be successful? Yes, I have the helmet, I have the breastplate, I have the shield of faith. I just seem to lack the strength. Often I fall down and I want to stay down. My joy is running low. I am in my armor, a clad weenie. I've, I, I'm weak in this. But this is not the way God wants me to fight. But it is the way the enemy loves to see me fight. Weak, vulnerable, hurting, questioning, defeated, overwhelmed, and ready to be done. Yet John's desire, God's desire, is that our joy would be full. And when our joy is full, our heart cries, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. His glory overpowers all the shadows creeping in. And one of the first place uh, people recorded dying for their faith in, was in Acts, where he looked up, Stephen did, and he saw the Lord not sitting next to God in his right hand, but standing there and welcoming him home. See, our hope is not in this world and what it has to offer. Our hope is on eternal things. A heavenly reward, a gracious and merciful loving God who fills us with his glory. See, our joy is filled in Jesus. We can have fellowship with God because that relationship has been restored in Jesus. We have stepped out of death and into life when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. And if you were able to stand back and look at your life from a distance, the beginning all the way into eternity, what is the most important thing you have ever done? I would say it's putting your trust in Jesus Christ. You are loved by God and he will never take that away. He loves you no matter what choices you make. He sees you as vulnerable, uh, not vulnerable, but he sees you as a valuable treasure that he would give everything to have. He sent his son to die for you, his son just to provide the way if you would just choose it. Is this not something to rejoice over? We are told his thoughts are more than the grains of sand. He counts your hairs, catches your tears, writes down the things of your life, and has written your name in a very special book. He right now is preparing a place for you so you can come and be with him. He has promised to wait for you and calls you his own, his special possession, his bride, sons and daughters. You are chosen and wanted. He knew you before the foundation of the world. You are a child of the king. Is that not something to rejoice over? So where is your focus tonight? Yes, what is happening in your life is important. It is important to God also. The feelings you have are important, and God is there with you. 
but he wants your cup to be full, overflowing with joy in him. That's what we have to look forward to. We're going to close with that tonight, and we'll pick it up again next week. So before we end, let's pray. Father, thank you for this evening, Lord. I pray, Father, that you'd help us. Help us to have joy in you, Lord. Fill us with joy, Lord, and that we could keep our focus on you, especially during this time of year. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.